Do you see any intention or anything in like the ordering of this of the cosmos? Yeah. So if uh, intent is an interesting question when imposed on the universe. For the longest while, philosophically, people imagined that the universe was some perfect place. Earth was a haven for life, especially human life, and everything is just right for us. And that would leave you thinking that there's some intent to the universe, that the universe is serving our needs. And of course, this is, as you would suspect, very strong in religious philosophies, where the adherents of that particular religion are sure that they are more special than any other religion, or more correct in so doing. When you look at the large-scale universe and you see these structures, what you have to ask yourself is, suppose all the galaxies were exactly equally spaced, rather than in these filaments and structures. Perhaps you'd be asking the same thing. Oh, look at, is there some intent here? Look how beautifully ordered it is. Ask yourself, is there some configuration of the universe where you wouldn't ask that? Because if there isn't, then the question doesn't actually aim towards a unique answer. If anything you see out there looks like it's ordered to you, then the question, you can't ask the question. You have to be able to ask the question such that if it were this other way, you would reject it. Now, the people who said Earth is a haven and all this, the fossil record argues differently. <laughs> 97, 8 percent of all life that ever existed is now extinct. That's the sign not of a planet that loves its life. That's a sign of a planet that wants it to get the life the hell off. Right. That's okay? the, the anti-haven. Right? That's right, yeah. right. We are alive not because, but in spite of it. From tsunamis, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, droughts, floods. Every year, they kill thousands of people. Thousands. You're kind of bumming me out, I have not, to say. I'm not done. <laughs> not to mention asteroid impacts. Took out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Earth is in a shooting gallery. You want to say there's intent? Yeah, the intent is to kill us, okay? <laughs> There's your intent. Wow. So, so the more you look at the universe, the less clear any purposeful intent there is. On that upbeat note, <laughs> uh, we're going to need to. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, you want to upbeat? Give us when, one. When, when, the uni when, the, when the asteroid comes? Yes. Okay. Uh, if I'm we listening. have people who, who reject the science world and the asteroid is headed towards us, they will be doing a number of things praying, certainly. Uh, they'll be running away from the impact point. They'll be buying toilet paper and bottled water. And whereas, if you had scientists in your midst and engineers, when the asteroid comes, they say, how can I deflect that? <laughs> Two completely different outlooks on your fate. So I'm, if I'm bumming you out by saying there's disaster that will kill us, yep. I'd like to lift you up again by saying it may be that innovations in science and technology may be the only thing that can save us from ourselves. You debummed me. That's perfect. <laughs> In a free society, a free pluralistic society, where the freedom of the expression of religion is constitutionally protected, which is a fundamental part of why America was so attractive to immigrants from around the world whose religious differences were not being supported in their hometown, I will never be one to tell you what you should believe or what you should not believe. What I will say is that if you want to say that where we don't understand things, that's where God rests, that's where God operates, the God of the gaps argument, because I get asked that all the time. What was around before the universe? I don't know. Must have been something, God. So they got to stick in God where we're not there yet. And I just say, well, I got, we got top people working on that. That's. <laughs> It's a current frontier. We're not there yet. And given the history of the moving frontier, where people had previously said, well, God must be operating, we're long past that. We, those explanations have come. And so I, I don't, there's no compelling reason to say God did it and then sort of give up and go on to the next problem. My issue with the God of the gaps is that if you feel that way, you should not be writing the science curriculum of a classroom, okay? That's all, okay? Because if you do, you are 
undermining the very process of what science is all about. Because the God of the Gaps principle is like a, it's a philosophy of ignorance, whereas science is a philosophy of discovery. And that's an important distinction between the two. And if you remove that foundation for what builds science, you are undermining the capacity of your culture, of your nation, to compete technologically in this, the 21st century. So it is not without consequence to have conducted that way. A thousand years ago, uh, the intellectual center of the world was Baghdad. Baghdad. Europe was busy disemboweling heretics at the time. Baghdad was open to all thought at the time, between AD 800 and 1100, around there. If you look at the advances that unfolded in that period, in that location, it includes uh, the, the, the invention of algebra. Algebra is an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. Two-thirds of the stars in the night sky that have names have Arabic names. How does that happen? Just, what, where did the naming rights come from? It came from the fact that at that time, huge advances in the Middle East, in Baghdad in particular, um, was uh, unfolded in engineering, mathematics, especially mathematics, astronomy, navigation, um, uh, physiology. And you say, well, why is that so? If you look at what was going on, they were open to all lines of thought. Jews, Muslims, Christians. There were doubters back then. Today, we would call them atheists. They would all come around a table and share ideas. If you have some philosophy that's got holes in it, someone's going to find it. And you're going to challenge you on those ideas. And what happens is the conversation ratchets up. You discard what doesn't work and you keep what does. And when you do that, you make discoveries and you make discoveries rapidly. And at the time, that period drew to a close. If you read history books, you'll typically describe sort of the, the sacking of Baghdad. It was a bad time for the city. And they say, oh, it all came to an end. However, the Islamic culture rose at other times later. And in those other times, science and engineering discoveries were not a part of it. So he asked, what, why not? You got the cultural heritage, why doesn't it show up again? And then you got to dig a little deeper from the sacking of Baghdad and you find out there was a, a Muslim cleric, Al-Ghazali was his name, who was to Islam what St. Augustine was to Christianity. St. Augustine kind of laid out the rules for how to be a good Christian at the time. A lot of people were practicing it in their own way. He codified it. He was a religious scholar, figured it out according to his own read, told everybody how to behave. There's the book. You follow this, you're a good Christian. Al-Ghazali said, you follow this, you're a good Muslim. In that text included the assertion, which gained influence socially, but then politically, so then it had power of influence, in there was the assertion that mathematics and the manipulation of numbers was the work of the devil. The entire enterprise collapsed and never recovered. It has not recovered since. If you look at the number of Muslims who have won the Nobel Prize in the sciences, it's one. Number of Jews who have won the Nobel Prize, one fourth of all Nobel Prizes in science have been won by Jews. How many Muslims in the world? 1.3 billion. How many Jews in the world? 15 million tops. So you look at what effect the culture of discovery and learning can have on what you discover about the natural world. It's extraordinary. So just because you're making discoveries doesn't mean it's forever. And I look at the 20th century in America as a period of great discovery. And then I see forces now operating against it. And then I look at the history of the consequences of this, and I see America just simply fading into insignificance. No, it's not off of a cliff. It's just a slope. And every next day, you're a little bit further down on the slope. You barely notice it, right? Until one day you can't see over the hill that you just came from. And then you try to make do with what you have down here. And then you find out it's the rest of the world making the inventions and not you. You're trailing, no longer leading. You're not even abreast with what's going on. You're running behind trying to catch up.